This game sucks and I hate it. It has nearly no redeeming qualities, and on PC, it's a literal garbage fire. I do not recommend this game to anyone under any circumstances. While I think it's the worst of the four Dead Rising games I've played so far, it's also just a boring slog of a game in its own right, unrelated to the series it's attached to. As you can see, this is a very long video. The first half of it will be going through the major specific elements to the game that I didn't enjoy for the most part, and the last half is me giving out about how terrible the story is. There are timestamps included, so please feel free to watch the video in chunks if you'd like. The story section is split up into two segments, one for mild and one for heavy spoilers. Also, the obvious, I will be comparing this to the other games in the series which I've done videos on, so if you want the full context, you can go ahead and watch those first. With all that out of the way, we can begin. Dead Rising 3 was a launch title for the next-gen Xbox One, meaning it came out in 2013. One year later, Capcom ported it to the PC. If you couldn't tell from my introduction, I played the PC version. I need to add a disclaimer right here and now. I had so many crashes, literally at least 20 or so in my 20 hours of playing. This being the case, I did everything I could out of game and in game to keep it from crashing, including turning down the visual quality to low, which seemed to work for the most part. If the game looks like shit, that's probably why. Don't blame me, blame Capcom for their shitty port. Since we're already on that topic, let's just jump right in. In addition to crashes, I had screen tearing, flickering, and floating shotguns prop up every few minutes. I don't know if any of this is exclusive to the PC version, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Another technical issue that was probably immediately apparent to anyone who has eyes is how close the camera is to your character. The FOV slider is at a staggeringly low 47. There's no way to change this in-game, so I downloaded a quick fix to zoom it out to a 70 or 75. Unfortunately, a heavy screen flicker propped up with that installed, so I had to remove it. Which means we're stuck with this garbage camera distance, because of course when you're trying to survive a zombie apocalypse, seeing the main character's back is much more important than your surroundings. There's also a very common bug that could erase your save file and character level. Sometimes when you start up the game, it thinks you haven't played before, and if you hit continue without thinking, your level will reset back to 1. What you need to do when this happens is quit out of the game entirely and open the application again. If you select it, it's all over. Always double check that your level is correct. This almost happened to me quite a few times, and if it did... Honestly, I'm not sure if I could push through to make this video. I can't even believe I played this garbage twice. Starting off, the map is much larger than both previous installments, but how anyone at Capcom Vancouver thought this was an interesting world to explore is beyond me. Even looking at it at a glance, the color palette is gray and brown. A pretty stark difference when just coming from the neon bright Fortune City, but even looking at the original game, there was a fair range of colors, even though it was working with 2006 hardware. No matter where you go will be a sea of gray, but if you're lucky, you might spot an array of muted reds, yellows, and greens. The developers boasted how Los Perdidos is twice or even three times the size of Fortune City and the Willamette Mall. Quantity over quality is a pretty good tagline for this game as a whole, and nowhere is that felt more than with the open world design. It's shocking to me how you can have such a large map with four apparently distinct areas, and even after 20 hours of playing, I couldn't tell you a single distinguishing characteristic of any of them. Besides gray roads and gray buildings, I could maybe say one of them had mansions in it? The part I remember most was the Gray Highway, which, if we can count it as its own separate area, was the worst area in the entire series to this point. It's obviously just a stand-in for the explicit loading screens between areas, but I would have preferred they not even bothered. The driving in this game is truly terrible, which I'll get to in more detail later, so constantly having to travel back and forth on this highway was torture, and honestly wasted more of my time than if they gave me a loading screen. If you offered me the option of sitting through loading screens between each and every area, even as long as 20 seconds, or making me drive through this boring highway system, I'll take the explicit loading screens 10 times out of 10. You of course can't have this gigantic area be devoid of buildings, so there's an appropriate amount of them lining the streets. However, you can't enter anywhere close to all of them, so many will be boarded up or arbitrarily locked. I say arbitrarily as when a door is unlocked, Nick, the main character this time around, kicks it open forcefully, but when it's locked, he gently tries to push it open. This is a game where you can run over streetlight posts and fences without a problem, you can even take a lawnmower over a fence, 
and the tutorial shows you that you can break open fence doors with a wrench. But these doors and walls though, yeah, they're impenetrable. Maybe Nick randomly has the knowledge of whether a door will be open or not, so he doesn't even try to kick them. Even when they aren't locked or boarded up, there are plenty of doors that you just aren't allowed to interact with. For other kinds of games, this isn't as big of a deal, but this is a Dead Rising game. The original had unique stores in every plaza, and all of them were accessible. For all intents and purposes, many of the structures are just present to not immediately break suspension of disbelief and to be another obstacle for the player. The buildings that you are allowed to explore in aren't very interesting. Since Los Perdidos is a fictional city that people live in, most of what you'll see are random people's houses, which aside from an arbitrarily placed tragic ending or Frank statue collectible, don't contain much to be excited about. The few stores that do exist in the city are okay, but something about them felt eerily similar. I honestly can't tell you if there are many toy stores with a grenade launcher in a crib or just one, but either way, it's a damn in quality. If it's only one store that had this, that means even though it's a distinct location in the city, I wouldn't have ever known since everything looks so similar anyway. If there is more than one, why is there more than one? How are there multiple stores that have a crib with a grenade launcher in it? Why is there a grenade launcher in a crib anyway? Speaking of nonsensical and unbelievable world design, the actual layout of walkable pathways, climbable ledges, and enterable doorways is extremely restrictive, sometimes literally. There were so many instances where there was a clear gap I should have been able to walk through, but the level designers must not have been coordinating with the rest of the team or something, as the character model is too big to fit. It just looks goofy. On a grander scale, there's rarely ever multiple ways to get to a specific spot or vantage point, meaning sometimes the act of just getting into a random building might mean you need to imagine what the developers were thinking when they designed it. It doesn't matter if at the top of your jump your head clears the ledge, it doesn't matter if every other vehicle was climbable. The only way in is finding that one specific way. This turns certain collectibles on the map into a chore, nearly a puzzle to get to. You know a blueprint or whatever is right there on the map, so you circle around the building a few times trying to find an entryway. When that doesn't work, you need to read the level design and see where the developers are pointing you towards. It doesn't feel like you found some secret area when you finally get there, it feels like you've figured out how to get to a dot on a map that's been there the entire game. Even ignoring how it feeds into the gameplay, it's hard to look at some areas on the map and not bust out laughing. I'm not here to point out that certain interiors don't hold up to something like a Naughty Dog game or anything. I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting to not get blasted in the face with something as egregious as this. Look at this fenced-in area. What is this for? Why is there a cop car in here? How did it get here? How does anyone get back here? The only way out is to climb on the cop car or the dumpsters. Crafting a believable world clearly wasn't their top priority. It seems their top priority was to litter the map with collectibles and side quests so the player never has to think or explore on their own. Don't worry about figuring out where things are in this muted monochromatic world. Instead, stare at the mini-map while you go, or simply walk towards the many destination markers that clutter your screen. I don't think Capcom Vancouver understands what makes secret hunting fun. Well, they did. As an off the record, the security keys were an example of a good way to go about it. For some reason, in those two years, the developers thought instead of letting players find things for themselves, they should plaster every conceivable secret on the map from the get-go. The Frank statues are a perfect example of this. These are inexplicable, as in they wouldn't exist in this world, they're only here for the player's enjoyment. Obviously, in the city of Los Perdidos, you wouldn't actually find these about. That doesn't mean they wouldn't be a welcome inclusion as a secret, but because they share the map with ZDC speakers and tragic endings, collectibles that do exist in the game world, as in they are diegetic, it blurs the lines for no reason. Not only for no reason, it turns it into a chore, something that's needed to clean the map up. Instead of exploring areas to see if you can find one of these guys, you open up your map, see a Frank statue, and go in that direction. Of course I'll explore this area, that's where the game is telling me to explore. The decision makes itself. It's a task on the map, don't you want to tick those boxes to gain experience? This mindless approach bleeds into the quest design as well. You won't ever have to worry about listening to characters, trying to find landmarks they talk about, or think at all really. Just follow the destination markers on the screen as they magically will take you exactly where you need to go. Need to find three spray paint cans in the city? That sounds like an incredibly hard and tedious task. 
Good thing the map knows precisely where they are, down to the millimeter. The quest giver didn't know where they were, Nick didn't know where they were, but the map did. So just don't think about it, okay? During a part of the main quest, Rhonda tells you where to find the illegals. She says to be on the lookout for their spray-painted symbol. Hey, it's the spray-painted symbol from earlier that the player has already been introduced to. What is the sensible thing to do here, given the fact that it's a symbol the player is familiar with and a main character has given you instructions to look out for it and it's an open world that encourages you to explore? Take all agency away and place a marker on the map at the exact location you're looking for. Oh no, this guy lost all of his tarot cards and needs you to go find them. Good thing the map knows precisely where they are. Getting more specific with the collectibles, the tragic endings are among the most arbitrary and flat-out dumb things I've ever seen in an open-world game I played. Now, the idea of them is kind of interesting. Basically, you come across corpses that appear to have died in a specifically sad way, specific enough to have a snappy sentence to go along with it, and Nick reacts melodramatically. The first issue is, of course, why does my map know where these are? Secondly, what makes these corpses so special? Why do these ones cause Nick to get sad and emotional and not others? There were quite a few dead bodies that looked like they had just as sad of a story as the others, but Nick doesn't care about them, and neither does your map. There's also the lack of interactivity involved. With the ZDC speakers, you destroy them. With the blueprints, you pick them up and can make a combo weapon with them. And the Frank statues, you also pick up. With the tragic endings, you just walk up to them and then sad music plays. This is just crazy. Woohoo, you get experience. Something more should have been included. Taking pictures of them as evidence would have been a perfect fit, but obviously Nick isn't Frank, so they couldn't copy his gimmick this time around. I have a better idea of how to not only make them more interactive, fit the Dead Rising 3 themes about constant government surveillance, but also explain why certain corpses trigger and some don't. Put a security camera close by that Nick can hack, letting us watch a cutscene of the person's literal tragic ending. This way, the other random corpses that don't trigger the sad music make sense as there's no camera nearby, Capcom Vancouver gets to have their fun creating gruesome death cutscenes that they love doing so much, and we can understand why Nick would be sad about coming across his thousandth dead body. Apparently, the new direction for the series was based around driving. You can create combo... vehicles... Oh, God. Driving is necessary for a few of the main story quests, and the four distinct districts were separated by a forceful trek down a connected freeway to seemingly encourage utilizing vehicles to make your way around the way too big for its own good map. All that being said, before reading how big of a deal driving was to their vision, I would have never guessed that was the case. Out of every video game I can remember playing with cars in it, I have never felt less incentivized to use one. There are constant roadblocks all over every district in the city, this was intentional, apparently. The feeling of being forced out of the vehicle to proceed on foot was vital to their vision, so instead of following through with their vague idea of running out of gas, nearly every intersection has either military blockades or conveniently placed fire trucks and school buses to block you. The feeling of seeing your quest marker appear on the other side of the map is frustrating enough, but when you factor in the rigmarole of vehicle play, it's so much worse. You have three choices. Go on foot the entire way and have it take an eternity, being bored out of your mind. You can take a vehicle and drive the shortest possible route, getting out when you find a roadblock and search for a new car on the other side. Lastly, you could be stubborn like I was most of the time and constantly open up the map to find the path that would avoid most of the roadblocks. The path, of course, being a very circuitous one. None of these options are fun. Let me clear that up right now but at least one meant that I wasn't forced to exit and enter vehicles over and over. If the locomotive aspect of the vehicles are bad, surely they're at least fun to kill zombies with? Well, kind of. I think the developers were far too confident in their idea that mowing down zombies with a car is fun without getting stale. It was a pretty good time in the previous games, but the nice thing about those moments was it was your decision to hop in a vehicle to kill zombies. The vast majority of the time when you're in a vehicle, it's solely for transportation purposes. Running down zombies doesn't bring me any joy, and if anything just annoys me more since they're somehow extremely adept at jumping, climbing, and hanging on to cars when they're moving. These zombies can't figure out how to walk around or over a handrail, but a moving vehicle is no problem for them. The only time I ever had fun while driving was when my car would blow up, which jettisoned me into the next dimension. 
Genuinely, I laugh nearly every time when this happens. Since this was the only time I truly felt happy when playing this game, I'll splice a few clips of them in now and then to help the mood. The crafting of combo vehicles is extremely stupid, full stop. Give a man a blowtorch and he can put a steamroller onto a van or even a motorcycle? It's all so silly. The heavy emphasis on the combination weapons was too much for me. They didn't even make it subtle. In the story cutscenes, Nick is constantly referred to as a person who can fix anything. And in the first 10 minutes, Rhonda says this. You're good at fixing things. There's a lot of stuff around here. How can you not roll your eyes when the game makes it this ham-fisted? One of the collectibles around the map are the blueprints, which allows you to make certain combination weapons. There's no need to find a workbench this time around, which isn't a terrible thing. As I did point out in the second game, I didn't love that I had to walk back all the way to the workbench to make things. But I'll be honest, this mechanic just isn't for me. Combo weapons and vehicles, I'm just not interested in it at all. The sheer amount of variations based on the dragon parade head astounded me. Since I barely bothered to craft the first iteration, I certainly wasn't going to craft the... Let me see here. Four different versions of them. There's apparently eight iterations of the Freedom Bear. That's insane. Why? Who? Why on earth is there even an option to combine a battle axe with a video game console? It just talks when you slash. What is the point? Who is this for? All of this just muddies up what the original concept for the first game was all about, using anything and everything to fight off zombies. In that game, there was rarely a definitive good weapon around for you to use. Handguns you can find easily, but they weren't that great. The only other place to find guns was the gun shop, and that was only if you defeated a very difficult boss. Other than that, find the hidden mini Uzis or wait for the military to arrive. Shooting zombies with guns wasn't the point by any means, and even powerful weapons like the katana and battle axes were exceptions. If you learned the game and map, finding a katana, a battle axe, and the mini chainsaw wouldn't be terribly difficult, but if it was your first time playing, you might not have much in the way of weaponry. As an example, I talked about using cash registers in the fight against Adam the Clown. I even used gumball machines and benches to clear the ways of zombies. You know what I used nearly exclusively in Dead Rising 3? Broadswords, katanas, battle axes, assault rifles, shotguns, large machine guns, and rocket launchers. You'll stumble on these strong weapons every other step it feels like. It all felt like such a foregone conclusion. Oh, here's a strong weapon. Okay, I guess. I'll use it to kill the next boss. Sometimes I didn't have enough room for them. I was stacked. Even if you wanted to use some of the more random objects, it's basically a flip of the coin on whether or not you'll be allowed to pick it up. Right away in the introduction sequence, I was shown this was the case, as I wanted to pick up this orange barrel, but alas, I wasn't allowed to. That's just insane to think how far we've come from the original. The spirit of Dead Rising is lost. What we have instead is a generic open-world zombie-killing RPG. The objects you can still use in this iteration are completely neutered. I mentioned benches earlier, as I would use them to clear a path of zombies in the first game. Just watch how differently they handle. One has a weight to it, you can practically feel Frank struggling with it, and Nick whaps it around like it weighs nothing. No momentum at all, no consideration to what it might look like if you picked up a park bench to swing around. The same sort of side-by-side -side comparison can be done with the umbrella. It was used in all previous games in its open state to plow zombies down. And knowing that, when I found one, that's what I was intending to use it for. Well, now it's just a stabby stabby weapon. I should have brought a dragon head, then I could glide around with it, because of course I could. The combat in general is such a step backwards, but I would imagine most would think the exact opposite. It's definitely a faster paced game, as you can slash quicker, your movement speed thankfully isn't terribly slow, and you now have two distinct attack types, quick and strong. In addition to the starting speed increase, you will now snap to the nearest zombie nearby. It's like an auto-aim function, but for melee attacks. In the first game, it may have looked like that was the case when you attacked, but what was happening was every time you swung, Frank's feet would move forward regardless. If there was a zombie in your way, great. If not, you missed. Now, it seems no matter what, you'll warp to the nearest enemy. I think the developers overcorrected with the melee combat. It was pretty tough to handle in the previous games when you had the, of course, extremely slow starting movement speed, 
but after you were upgraded, it felt like a pretty good balance. You could reposition and dart around enemies fairly quickly, so it kept things feeling responsive and very much in your control. Since Nick is already faster from the get-go, this warping shenanigans really wasn't necessary, and if anything makes combat encounters feel worse than they would without it. It just feels so mindless slashing through a horde of zombies while the auto-aim kicks in. This already isn't good, but in addition to that, they made Nick's starting momentum the slowest of any of the previous characters. If you get hit, get grabbed, drop a weapon, have a weapon break on you, or even stop aiming your gun, Nick will start at a dead stop, slowly begin moving his feet before getting back to his normal speed. I at times would intentionally roll immediately to kickstart his momentum a bit. Even with the newly added sprint mechanic, if you're in one of these dead stop positions, he will still meander for a while before starting to give a shit. You absolutely can't have this lack of lateral movement when in tight combat scenarios. It's even worse knowing this is a Capcom product, the same publishers that gave us Devil May Cry. It might seem a little bit silly to be able to run back and forth on a dime, but that's imperative when it comes to giving the player all of the control when it comes to positioning and spacing. What they should have done instead was absolutely not add the attack warping auto-aim thing, and instead make his momentum the same as Frank's or Chuck's, but at a faster speed the whole way through. I'm happy the roll mechanic is better utilized in this game, actually being useful for a few fights, but that's not an excuse for him turning into a snail multiple times during a boss encounter. If anyone wants to claim the realism angle for this edition, you're out of your fucking mind. This is a life or death scenario, and anyone on Earth with working legs that isn't even in a life or death scenario could move laterally quicker than Nick can. For someone who can jump to climb up buildings without a problem, I would expect him to be more agile than a literal sloth. The survivors this time around are awful, and in more ways than one. First of all, and this goes along with every NPC that isn't an explicit boss fight, you can't damage anybody. In the previous games, if you wanted to screw yourself over by killing off an important main quest character, the game would let you do it. You could also friendly fire any survivors tagging along with you, they'd even turn on you after a while. My frustration towards that guy in the fully stocked grocery store wouldn't have had a cathartic ending if I couldn't pulverize him with a sledgehammer. No matter who it is, NPCs are off limits this time around. What's worse, they spout out the same dialogue lines over and over. You gonna kill a poet? She's reacting as if I'm attempting to kill her, but of course her health bar is impenetrable. I literally attempted to kill every NPC in the game once I saw this. If the decision to kill NPCs is off the table, then Nick not being a murderous psychopath has no weight. I never went out of my way to kill survivors in the previous games, for the most part, but the fact that I could have makes that decision mean something. If you take away the player's agency on the matter, you railroad them into the role of an action hero instead of letting them decide that for themselves. Even ignoring the agency argument, it just makes things feel artificial. In this small side quest here, one of the ways to finish it is by killing the other person. So even though the end result is me killing this man, I'm not allowed to even touch him until the game decides it's ready for me to make that decision. How utterly bonkers is that, right? This is the purpose of the quest. This was one of the methods of completing it, is to kill him. But not yet. Okay, now you can kill him. Good job. Here is your experience. Pat on the head. Beyond that, all of their side quest stuff is extremely monotonous. Nearly all of them are some sort of fetch quest, and like I've mentioned earlier, the blatant hand-holding destination markers cause them to not only be formulaic, but outright boring. Finding five tarot cards, destroying five sigils, bringing three items to someone. There's one where some guy wants you to beat up five zombies with your bare hands. And that's when it became crystal clear that I just wasn't going to bother with any of these side quests. None of them interested me in any way, shape, or form. Except for one of them. This guy here at the pool is keeping his zombie family alive, but he's worried they aren't getting enough food, so he asks for you to find him some meat. 
He makes it sound like he wants human meat. He brings up the fact that if the cure happened, he wouldn't want them to die. Fair enough, I like that concept, which I mentioned in the Dead Rising 2 video, so I wanted to help him out. I figured human meat would mean that I could push him in for the perfect irony, but of course he's inexplicably invincible. Turns out he'll accept a chicken. That's pretty boring. Apparently if you bring survivors here as an option, they end up killing the zombies, which ruins the quest anyway, but that's not what I did. I thought for sure I had the perfect solution. Only the cleverest of players would figure this one out, so I thought. Before this side quest, you most likely encountered a storyline boss who was harvesting human organs. There were a lot of coolers full of organs in that area, so on my second playthrough I kept one in my inventory for this very occasion. And unbelievably, this doesn't count. I bring him literal human organs, and the game says no. How this wasn't accounted for by the development team is astounding to me. They also just missed the mark entirely with this encounter. You could apparently bring him any food like sushi or hot dogs and it would count. This guy is basically trying to convince you that everyone's going to die here anyway, so why not sacrifice them for his zombie family? How they could turn such an interesting premise into such a boring payoff really says it all about Capcom Vancouver's vision for this franchise. It's impressive in a way. Another awful thing about these types of survivors is tied to your leveling stats. I'll get to the topic of these RPG elements in a minute, but for right now let's focus on this right here. Increase posse size. When starting the game I had no idea what this meant, but I saw its ramifications clear as day soon enough. When you come across a time when you can save two survivors at once, you just can't. I didn't understand why this certain guy wouldn't tag along with me, but I figured it was probably a glitch, which I've encountered many of, so I just left him there. It was only after a certain terrible boss fight did I realize I just couldn't have more than one at a time. Who the fuck thought this was a good idea? If anything, the previous games offered a perfectly balanced decision when you come across multiple survivors. Their AI wasn't the best, so the addition of more survivors might end up costing you the lives of the ones currently in your party. Even ignoring that, tying this to a non-diegetic stat doesn't even make any sense. This isn't a game where you have dialogue options that a charisma stat might influence. You aren't convincing them to join your party or anything. It's not like they're opposed to the idea, they just stand there, unable to acknowledge the imaginary barrier that prevents them from coming with you. The other type of survivor is a new addition, and they're just as bad as the other variation, but for different reasons. You'll find these stranded survivors all over the city, everywhere. I'm assuming these are all radiant quests, which would make sense since all of their names are very generic and a few of them have the same voice lines. Help! 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 The way they can achieve this is, of course, not allowing you to escort them to a safe location or anything. Instead, you kill a horde of zombies that are nearby, then they announce that they're taking their towns to South Beach and zoom out of sight. I could make a joke about them not needing my help since they're this fast, but the survivors being so quick was intentional, as was their tendencies to take sharp corners. They eventually disappear, so the game is trying to move the survivor into a location where you hopefully can't see them vanish right in front of your eyes. Well, I caught one of them red-handed. It's actually easier to see when you're on the highway. I tried to run them over, but they vanish basically immediately after you're done saving them. When you're nearby, helping them with their zombie issue, they never shut the fuck up either. Just listen to this guy. I had an easier time believing the NPCs in the 2006 Dead Rising than a game that came out seven years later. This is just absurd. The cherry on top is how the game flat out lies to you. If you keep driving or running by the stranded survivor, within moments the game will proclaim them as dead. Within moments. However, I stuck around one time, killing absolutely zero zombies, watching a survivor do it themselves. 
I'm here to report that they can actually fend for themselves, and even more, when they defeat all of the zombies, you get the credit and they thank you anyway. You can't make this crap up. I can't believe that. Thanks for saving me. The tone for Dead Rising 3, to its detriment, is far more serious than the previous games. One of the reasons the original stood out, besides the premise of a zombie-infested mall, was how even though the subject matter was dark, the setting and world design was, in contrast, very light. You were just in a mall. There was casual music playing in the background, the stores and advertisements were eye-catching and colorful, and even the mall itself carried on as usual, with the lights turning off automatically when it was the normal closing time. The zombies were bumbling idiots for the most part, as even said by a survivor himself, and were the perfect test canvases for horse masks and ketchup bottles. The atmosphere as a whole for the explorative segments of the game was almost welcoming to an extent, but there existed the other half of the game that would sometimes catch you by surprise when it was sprung on you. The tone would dramatically shift at the next story sequence or whenever you encountered a psychopath. Zombie stories don't strictly tell the tale of how dangerous zombies are, they're a convenient environment to let humanity, good and evil, play out. The horrors of what can happen to otherwise normal people in a functioning society when they're pushed to their survival instincts. Some clearly demonstrate a willingness to take advantage of the situation. Both in the story sequences and boss fights, all of the actors at play, the ones with real power in these scenarios, are shown to be regular humans. This is why the zombies being ridiculous, and for the most part, stupid, fits Dead Rising perfectly. This ebb and flow of light-hearted and carefree zombie exploratory segments into consequential and serious story and psychopath encounters was a loop that kept the game from towing the line of being pretentious. Hammy drama the entire way through is exhausting. In comparison, Dead Rising 3 never attempts to let up for any considerable amount of time, and if anything, it looks like they've attempted to switch the roles that the zombies and psychopaths served originally. The zombies themselves are much more dangerous and abundant, Dying to them is a real possibility, and I don't remember a time where I laughed at a zombie's expense. Since the city isn't a contained destination like a mall or a casino strip, you don't get curated song selections, and everything looks ugly as sin, as there was a clear effort to make the city look like it's been through hell. Exploring on your own, something that was a break from the heavy gloom and doom of the bosses and story, is now just as high strung and overbearing as everything else. The bosses seem almost sillier this time around, but Honestly, that might be for the fact that they're all terrible, and there's nothing to contrast them to. The survivors play a part in this as well. The zombies in the first title sometimes showed how threatening they were not by how easily they could kill you, but how easily they could kill or turn one of your survivors. This may have more to do with the clumsy AI, but at least the zombies offered a threatening scenario for anyone else that wasn't Frank, since of course he was the player character. In Dead Rising 3, their inexplicable invincibility goes completely against this new environment. If I'm being made to believe that we are in a near-apocalyptic setting where everything is horrible and there's no hope, and everything is grey of course, the survivors if anything should have been easier to kill. This new world is oppressive, the zombies are innumerable, but these survivors are invulnerable. I mentioned that constant hammy drama is exhausting, but sometimes it's downright suspension of disbelief shattering. To seemingly maintain this constant visual dread, the developers thought it would be a good idea to place bits of writing on walls of nearly every building inside and out. The most ham-fisted, carbon copy, generic shit you can think of, with few exceptions. Apparently when they weren't trying to fend off zombies or find food and water, the survivors took the time to write edgy bullshit on every wall. Contrast that to a similar but more understandable visual, someone spelling out help on this roof makes perfect sense, a roof is a place that is visible to helicopters, is a safe distance from zombies, and given any circumstance when anyone is stranded, the first thing they would do is spell out help. This matches the tone for depressing without punching it in your face. Going in a little closer, if this was meant to tell stories with the environment, what stories are they telling? Someone lost his wife, and to help him grieve, he finds some spray paint and writes that zombies killed his wife on a wall in an alley? And this one, like, I could spend all day doing this sort of thing. This is way too high up on this wall. Did someone take the time to drive a car over here to spray paint this? Maybe a zombie gave them a boost, I don't know. It might make sense, both the human writing this message and the zombie giving the boost have the same desire to kill the living, I guess. 
Speaking on the topic of zombies, this constant attempt to top themselves on how many zombies they can fit on screen at once in every successive game has long stayed past its welcome. Having more zombies in a given area at a given time means nothing to me. I don't get more enjoyment out of playing the game when my car can run over 10 extra zombies in a given stretch of time. My dopamine levels don't increase in any way when I get to blow up 50 zombies rather than 25. If I didn't look at the kill count, would I even notice the difference? This number inflation, if anything, just made it more and more absurd to me. The entire idea of a zombie outbreak, they're so easy to kill and they're everywhere. They're packed in the sewers, they're in abandoned houses, they fill the streets. It more resembles an infestation of bugs that can multiply. They even crawl out of windows of every building. Some of them the basement windows, making it look like they're just animals coming out to feed. When I first saw them do that, I just started laughing at the preposterousness of it all. This game wants me to take it seriously so badly, and I just can't. Let's talk about the RPG elements of the game. I have definitely said in the past that I do like the implementation of the leveling system overall, but I didn't like the damage attack increase or the slow starting speed. Gaining life, inventory space, and new skills was a pretty fun time back in the first game, and to a lesser extent, I felt the same way about the two versions of the sequel. Beginning the game fleshy with low inventory space and ending it with plenty of room for weapons and healing, as well as an increased health pool, felt like a genuinely good use of the leveling mechanics. What's great about it is it didn't bog down the game with useless bullshit. Just play the game and the leveling will happen on its own. Well, in Dead Rising 3, it's nowhere near that simple. You acquire attribute points for completing story missions, leveling up, and yada yada. Place these points into whichever skill you want to focus on. Certain skills cost more points after a while. I think that fact alone really soured me on this new way of gaining stats. After a while, leveling up meant I wouldn't get anything, as I had to hoard my points for things later on. As if I'm at Chuck E. Cheese and I choose to save up my tickets for a bigger prize. At least in the previous games, a gained level meant you got an immediate improvement, or at the very least a skill or a combo card. Now it may literally mean nothing. It's actually comical reading on the fandom page about what happens once you get to level 50. That's the level cap, of course, but you still fill the experience bar like normal, and will continue to gain attribute points. Incredible. They've unknowingly acknowledged how superfluous the numeric leveling system is. Great job, guys. I wrote a lot more on the RPG topic, but I think the majority of it stems from me not enjoying these types of leveling systems. Much like the combo weapons, this just doesn't appeal to me in any way. There's a few more random issues the game has that got on my nerves. Picking things up in this game is a pain, and I can't fathom why, as this was rarely an issue with the previous games. Maybe it's because everything is so cramped, but when you're trying to select something with the B button, getting the correct prompt to pop up is an enormous chore. So often would I unintentionally pick up a bagel or something when I wanted to activate a switch or what have you. Just watch me try to put on this cardigan. I have to make sure there are no items on the ground near it, move my survivor away, and fight with Nick himself who seems to love pushing against the wall that's just not even there. It may be realistic for your character to put their hand up against a wall when you walk towards it, but this small detail means something as simple as putting on a new outfit is more difficult. The magazines are different, before they were a conscious decision about inventory management, trading an empty slot for a buff of some kind. Now you add them to your infinite pause menu and select which one to have active at a time. With how many random bonuses you get from upgrading your skills anyway, I don't really see the point. The way you get side quests in general is among the laziest and utterly phoned in bits imaginable. Nick finds a transceiver thing from the random zombie after the opening of the story, there's someone on the other side, Jamie. He can't hear Nick, but Nick can hear him. He found a security area in the city where all the monitors are. This guy just decides to take on the job of informing Nick if there are any survivors alive. This guy doesn't know if Nick is even capable or willing to risk his life to save others. He just assumes Nick is the protagonist of a great heroic journey and is sure to inform you anytime anyone is in trouble. His carefree attitude comes across to me as obnoxious, but you could make an argument that this was their one attempt at easing the mood with humor. I just can't get over the fact that they didn't even try to make this fit in with what's going on. 
You need to accept that there are cameras in every area of the entire city. Jamie can only call one transceiver, and that's the one Nick now has. The transceiver itself is broken, only allowing Jamie to talk through it. Jamie, for some reason, assumes Nick will be willing to help out strangers when in reality he could barely survive going to the bridge in the tutorial area. And the act of telling Nick where survivors are is supposed to win your favor enough to feel indebted to him, enough to accomplish a few random missions that benefit Jamie. I haven't done it, as of course I didn't do nearly any of the side quests, but I have read his quest line thing. He does have some backstory which I don't care about. He asks you to do some favors for him at some point. Besides a non-diegetic influence like achievements, level ups, or just getting 100%, I have no idea why anyone would want to help this guy. Unfortunately, most of the boss fights in the game are part of the story, but there are six that are optional. I'm going to talk about seven right now, meaning I am going to include one storyline psychopath in this section, for a reason that will make sense in a second. Seven Psychopaths. It all seemed like a dream. No way, I thought when I read the achievements. There's no way they went that direction. After reading some articles online to confirm it, I concluded that the people in charge of Dead Rising 3 are hacks. Seven of the psychopaths are modeled directly off of the Seven Deadly Sins. None of these games have had any religious subtext to them in any way, but I guess that doesn't matter when trying to create edgy boss fights that will appeal to teenagers. I'll sum it up after I go through them all, but for the most part, I'm pretty insulted by this slapped-together attempt at including deeper themes. For the part of Wrath, we have Harry Wong. <laughs> At least that's what the Dead Rising fandom page tells me. He apparently has a disrespectful family, now a zombie outbreak happened, he's mad, he killed survivors who entered his Zen Garden. What caught my eye, before knowing about the Seven Deadly Sin thing, is just how lame he is. No attempt to get us to sympathize with him, which is a real step down from the two psychopaths and off the record, and no real uniqueness to him besides being Asian. His fight is boring, which will be the case for nearly every fight in the game, so buckle up. He's pretty fast, does flying kicks, and throws smoke bombs or something. His death cutscene follows a formula I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with at this point. Whoa, he killed himself. Whoa. That dude needed some blood pressure meds. Am I right, people? <laughs> oh god, we got a lot more to go. For the part of Greed, we have Albert. I think this is one of the more interesting fights in the series, and that's what actually annoys me the most about it. His gimmick is that he drugs survivors to steal their organs and make a profit. That's sociopathic to a degree we haven't really seen so far, so it fits in that regard, but the moment you wake up from being injected, all semblance of coherence is lost. He just lets you get up and walk around. The drug that he injected you with causes you to pass out now and then, as well as hallucinate. What will happen is you walk around, and it looks like many Alberts are all around you, but if you beat up the wrong one, you'll realize afterwards you killed a survivor. This is probably the only time the game will let you kill a survivor, actually. Why does he let his subjects walk around? How, how does this benefit him? What the fuck? Anyway, what I like about this fight is what the intended method of figuring out who the real Albert is, grabbing one of his organ coolers and tossing it on the ground. This enrages him, allowing you to figure out where he is to perform a grab attack, in which Nick injects him with the drug, then passes out immediately. So just so you're clear, this is a man who carefully laid out plans to harvest survivors' organs and set up arrangements with clients, but not only did he not think to strap his victims down, he doesn't even learn to kill the guy who just stuck him with his own drug after he passes out. It's mind-bogglingly stupid. Aside from that, the concept of the hallucinations and trying to figure out the real Albert by destroying his harvested organs, while unique and worthwhile as a concept, doesn't fit this game in any way. This is something I would expect from a psychological horror game. This is also the only one of the seven that's required, as this fight props up randomly during a main quest. You are supposed to find a stash of supplies to destroy, and instead Albert captures you. Slot that stash of supplies in with any of these seven psychopaths and nothing would change. Afterwards, Albert has hallucinations of zombies eating his organs, so he cuts himself open and pulls out his intestines. Cool, I guess. For the part of gluttony, we have Darlene. 
I don't think I even need to describe her, you can tell immediately what the developers were going for. She gets mad since other survivors are eating her food, and skinny boys are telling her to cut carbs or something. Anyway, in her fight, she for some reason is ridiculously fast in her scooter, throws sporks and other utensils at you, vomits on the floor so you slip on it, and runs to her food so she can regenerate her health. Oh yeah, she farts to get a speed boost too. There's not really much to say. This is a boss that exists. Once you defeat her, she has bad gas or something. She farts a lot, slips on her own vomit, then suffocates on her vomit. Disgusting and crass come to mind watching the cutscenes for this fight. Just embarrassing to be honest. I would be embarrassed to attach my name to this game and the creation of this fight. For the part of Lust, we have Dylan. Uh, the most I can say is at least we have a male sexualized character, I guess. He beckons Nick to do dirty things. Nick says he's not in the mood. Then Dylan shoots his giant flaming penis all over. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't intend to laugh. That's actually a pretty fucking funny line to say. <laughs> anyway, it's clear what demographic this is aimed for, right? In the fight, he uses his giant... <laughs> In the fight, he uses his giant metal penis to shoot you with flames or grenades. <laughs> not, not really much to say here either. <laughs> Afterward, <laughs> Afterwards, he says you gave him blue balls, because of course, and that's that. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. <laughs> Oh, fucking hell, maybe that is an okay boss. It just makes me laugh so hard in retrospect. Okay. For the part of Pride, we have Jerry Gallo, female bodybuilder. The entire crux of this altercation is her, her, woman can't be strong, so Nick constantly calls her a man, and she gets angry enough to fight him over it. Pretty pathetic, to be honest. At first, I thought she was trans, and they were going with a trans joke or something, but I don't think that's the case, thank fuck. Nick is just weirdly drawn to call her a mister for some reason. This fight actually gave me some trouble. She's really fast, and there's surprisingly not many good weapons nearby. Every now and then she'll walk in front of a mirror, I think, to do squats, which is her vulnerable state, grab her and beat her up. I think my favorite part about this fight is the visual of her using a loaded barbell as a weapon. That's just insane strength. Afterwards, in her death cutscene, she walks over to her trophy case, grabs it, and falls down, which crushes her. If you really want to make yourself sad, you can investigate the treadmills in this area. You, of course, could run on the treadmills in the previous games. Oh, I really liked those games. For the part of Sloth, we have Theodore Lagerfield Jr. I have some strong feelings on this guy here. Not only is he the worst boss fight in the game... He's the worst psychopath encounter in the entire series. Much like BB in the second game, you can't directly fight him. Unlike BB, there's nothing about this guy that's interesting and quite a few things that are offensively bad. So this guy is the son of the mayor or something and he's been hanging out in his bunker playing video games the whole time. He thinks Nick is one of his servants. Nick apparently knows this idiot has the key to the police armory. Which is news to me, as I've never seen them mention it before. Oh wait, I actually checked the fandom page. Apparently Nick knows about the key to the armory thanks to a very specific survivor from a side quest that I didn't do. We'll see something like this coming up in the next Psychopath. He doesn't give Nick the key, instead he... gets tired and yawns, then sends remote helicopter toys to fight you. He's locked in his room, so you need to find the remote access boxes and destroy them. Of course, you don't actually need to find them. The unmissable red destination markers are placed at their exact location. This is the entire encounter. You run around the house, smacking these boxes. Once you get them all, the door opens and then a cutscene plays. He has a heart attack, farts very loudly, then lunges at you while farting again. This is about as lowbrow and crass as you can get. Also, an incredible example of why picking a trope like the Seven Deadly Sins without thinking it through handicapped the development team for no good reason. Now, I didn't see a source for this quote in the fandom page, 
but apparently this fight was one of the harder ones to create because of the sloth theme. Well, it shows, because it's fucking awful. Finally, for the part of Envy, we have Kenny. He's tied up a woman to stage an action scene for himself or something. When you arrive, Nick knows who this guy is, apparently. You want to know why? Because I certainly didn't know. He's from that one quest I talked about earlier. The one I didn't do. Even though I didn't complete his quest, they pretend that I did anyway for this to work. Fantastic game, great fucking job. The crux of this fight is just ridiculously bad. The idea isn't awful, but its execution is terrible. He wants to be just like Nick and make combo weapons. <laughs> fucking, fucking Christ, he even says the words combo weapons. It's embarrassing. This game and its NPCs take this mechanic way too fucking seriously. I'm imagining a zombie movie like Shaun of the Dead or even something more serious like The Walking Dead having the characters announce that their crude bat with nails in it is a trademark combo weapon. It comes off like it's an advertisement for their own product, like they're stroking their own egos over this ingenious mechanic. It's eye roll inducing. So right, the game keeps telling me if I create combo weapons in front of Kenny, it will make him jealous and vulnerable. I looked around and there wasn't anything I could combo together. I even opened up the terribly done blueprint menu to scroll through all of them I had unlocked, not categorized by anything meaningful of course, and found nothing of use. I instead just continued to use my normal inventory. Afterwards, the zombies are closing in on him, I decided to kill them, but of course my posse size wasn't enough for the two of them, so I wasn't able to rescue Kenny, so I killed him. I'm genuinely surprised the game let me do it, as right afterwards it wouldn't let me kill the other random survivor. The worst part about all these terrible psychopaths is the seven deadly sins motif. There was literally no rhyme or reason to do this, and it turned out half-assed overall. Personally, I think the seven deadly sins trope is a very interesting one, my favorite implementation of it being the way it's used in the movie Seven, so to see it haphazardly applied to a few random shitty boss fights in an otherwise terrible game annoyed me quite a bit. I'll of course talk about the rest of the psychopaths when it's their moment to shine in the story. Don't worry, I'll get to them. So like I said before, I'm splitting the story into two sections. The heavy spoilers will begin in part two, which I'll warn you about when we get there. I don't think anything here, besides one character and one singular moment in the story is worth your time, but hey, who knows, maybe something here will spark your interest. If you're planning on ducking out and want a summary of my thoughts, there's nearly nothing about the story that I liked. The plot, the pacing of it, the quests themselves, the characters, and most of the directorial decisions like the blocking of certain camera shots or the acting itself. Some of the twists and turns throughout seem inconsequential and nearly pandering, and the decision to keep everything feeling so serious and suspenseful made the other issues that much more amplified, as it can't hide behind the guise of intentionally being bad for a campy style. So much for a summary, right? This is effectively me having a moan about every aspect of the game's story, so if you're down with that, we can begin. In this first prologue cutscene, we get a dramatized telling of another outbreak, this time in the city of Los Perdidos. Annoyingly, when the text showed the date, it just said March 23rd. The year this all takes place in is pretty important, especially given how it attempts to connect certain things to previous games. This time, instead of beginning the moment the outbreak begins, it's exactly 72 hours later, which to me looks very intentional. Both previous games, you had three days to finish the main story, so starting the game exactly three days later seems to be a deliberate attempt to separate this from the previous entries. I think it's a fairly worthless difference, all things considered, but it's a difference nonetheless. We begin with Nick climbing up onto a highway blockade thing. We proceed to have a very boring tutorial. Besides the saddening discovery of the different strengths of attacks and the inability to grab orange barrels, there's not much here. You find the bridge caved in, meaning you're still trapped in the city with no escape. Zombies start chasing you. Nick, for some reason, jumps in a very particular way off the bridge to completely crush his pelvis, but he's fine, no worries. Then the most inexplicable thing happens. 
A plane flies overhead and crashes right then and there. This doesn't relate to anything at all. It's just here to have a cool action cutscene, probably to show off how epic the graphics were for the Xbox One. After an attempted deep and emotional intro credits with sappy music, they ended off with a seizure-inducing white flicker. Thanks a lot, guys. Really good use of strobing lights. Because they're so up their own ass, the one thing they managed to keep in the game was the doomed survivors being overwhelmed by zombies, dying with no chance of survival. Apparently these people are from the crashed airplane, which, I mean, come on now. This exemplifies how truly lost Capcom Vancouver are when they don't have something to copy one to one, and tells me they didn't understand why it worked in the first place. First of all, the survivors themselves weren't soulless mannequins, a few of them had voice lines, you could see them talking and planning. More importantly, there was a hefty amount of dramatic irony at play. We of course know a zombie outbreak has to happen, that's what we signed up for when buying this game, but when you begin, the mall is empty and safe. This bit where you can walk around in safety has some tension, due to us knowing something is bound to happen, just not knowing how or when. Once it does happen, zombies are everywhere, a mad scramble takes place, people dying faster than you can comprehend. Having the names pop up wasn't just to give you the knowledge that these survivors had died, it was another way to assault your senses. It takes up basically the whole screen. Maybe while you were running to save your own life, a thought occurred that you could have potentially saved some of them, which the next cutscene even hints at. This time around, none of those details were taken into account. Every player who has gone through the previous two games knows they can't be rescued. The text describing their deaths is just there to rub your nose in something you had no control over. The zombies themselves aren't invading an otherwise safe area, as of course they're all over the city anyway and the people themselves aren't characterized in any fashion except for them somehow surviving a plane crash. While this gameplay sequence plays out, I hope you're noticing how utterly gray everything is. Also, take a look at this here. He could climb a van, but not a car. Seven years after the original, and the jumping mechanics are this inconsistent. You make it back to the diner, and we're introduced to a few characters we'll be seeing throughout. I think I may be in over my head here, as there's a plethora of awful in just these few minutes. You signed up for this, so let's start overanalyzing. The first thing I noticed is how poorly paced all of the dialogue is. It's like they run through their lines at light speed. There's also an outrageous amount of exposition packed into a few sentences when Rhonda and Annie talk back and forth. Literally, I didn't catch any of this on my first playthrough. None of it. So let's slow it down and explain a few things. The world is X amount of years removed from the last outbreak at Fortune City. We haven't been told yet, but it's very important to the plot. In that time, a Zombrex chip was created to be implanted into every infected citizen by the government, which does two things. It releases doses of Zombrex to stave off the zombification process, and if someone does become a zombie, it tracks their location like a GPS. Annie is infected, but is shown to be taking Zombrex. She is what they call an illegal, meaning she never got the Zombrex chip. What really threw me off was Annie's use of the word prisoner here. Those people are tracked by GPS. They're prisoners. Earlier when Nick escapes the bridge, I remember seeing zombies in orange jumpsuits. Prisoners, I assumed. I thought she was saying the prisoners were to blame for the outbreak, not the illegals. That slight hiccup in my line of thinking was enough to lose me in this high-speed ramble. How in the world do you take a minute and a half to describe the extremely inconsequential first 72 hours of this outbreak, but jam exposition about the Zombrex chip's existence, their functions for good and bad depending on whose viewpoint, illegals, and Annie and Rhonda's disposition towards the subject in a matter of 18 seconds. Next thing you know, this guy tells them to shut up. This trucker hat idiot calls him an asshole for it. Just shut up, they're gonna hear us. You know, why don't you call the hell down, asshole? As long as they're outside, we got nothing to worry about. Followed immediately by him turning on the still plugged in jukebox and alerting all of the zombies to their presence. Weird, I seem to remember this exact scene from something else. Something else far better than this. We see a zombie shoot a gun. Yeah, the mad lads fucking did it. They frame it as the zombies remembering their previous ways of life when human. The fact that they included that line, as if the player would buy into that shit, is not only naive, but embarrassing. For this next part, I again want to harken back to the original game, where this old lady lost her dog, then dismantled the blockade to save her dog, 
which doomed the rest of the survivors and led to her death. Proper foreshadowing beforehand, a somewhat sympathetic reason for her actions, but still crazy enough to be the right amount of ridiculous. This time around, we have this lady who is afraid to die, so she runs out into the zombies to die. Her son also dies because of it. What on earth? Why include this? Rhonda wants to evacuate to her garage. Why they weren't there in the first place is beyond me. Annie says she's fine with leaving, but isn't going to a garage for some reason. I don't even know why she's in this diner in the first place. It's not shown if she knows any of these people at all. So she runs out and easily escapes without a problem. Rhonda says this. We gotta do something. There's nothing to fight them off with. You're good at fixing things. There's a lot of stuff around here. Let me see if I can put something together. Because naturally a mechanic could take any old household item and tape it together to fend off a horde of zombies. It's even less reasonable since he turns a sledgehammer a weapon easily capable of taking down zombies already, and effectively adds a saw to the other side of it? What difference does that make? A lot, apparently, as now Rhonda is comfortable with leaving the diner. I can't believe I wrote a whole page about this stupid cutscene, but it was shockingly poor. We're gonna have to get used to this sort of thing. We get to the garage, and it seems even the creators could tell they went too fast with the exposition, as Rhonda reiterates about the Zombrex chip and its functions when they find one in a zombie. This is where Nick finds the transceiver and talks to Jamie. He tells you to go check out some hideout area for illegals, which is where we meet Spray Paint Girl, and that's how we get introduced to the safe houses and the illegals. After enough time has passed, you go back to Rhonda. You watch the news. The Secretary of Defense talks about the outbreak. Quarantine is for six days, then the firebombing will happen. While this is playing, I want to talk about how incredibly stupid the idea of the Zombrex chip is. I initially thought every citizen had to get one, but after a while you gather that only the infected have to get chipped. So I guess you just have to keep Zombrex with you anywhere you go in case you get bitten by a random zombie somewhere. Then after that, find the nearest Zombrex chip location to get the chip. At least if everyone was chipped, it would create a small safety net if you got bitten. The fact that it included the GPS function means that there was a real possibility that the Zombrex dosage wouldn't work, which isn't a good selling point to ditch the syringe form of Zombrex. Speaking of that, if this is a chip you get implanted with, one and done, how is it sustainable? The Zombrex would obviously run out unless it's being internally created somehow with energy from your body, which it isn't. Maybe they refill the chip every month or something stupid, H who knows? No one knows, since they hope no one would care enough to ask about it. You're urged to go to a security checkpoint somewhere not too far from you, but the trucker hat idiot says it's too far to walk and driving isn't safe either. Then this happens. We could fix up one of those. Or both. Reinforce one with the other? Combine them to make something stronger? Yeah, yeah, that's the same idea I had. Just just run with it. See what you can do, kiddo. After you construct the turret rig. Which, I mean, come on, how in the hell did this come from a steamroller and a car? Rhonda says this. You could probably make more of these out on the road now that you know what you're doing. I hate this game so much. If you didn't catch it, her saying that is the game's way of telling you that you can now craft combo vehicles anywhere in the world. It isn't like there's a complicated tutorial menu or hints that prop up every 10 seconds as it is. You drive to the checkpoint. Oh no, the military guy is dead. Then motorcycle guys show up. For me, this was the pit of despair as far as crashing was concerned. I think the game crashed maybe 10 or so times in this next fight. Utterly insane. You fight off guys in motorcycles, the big head honcho comes out, who apparently is a boss fight, and he's got a ridiculous steamroller motorcycle thing. Throw some Molotovs at him or ram him with your own cars. Afterwards, his death cutscene is boring. Nick throws a Molotov, he crashes, Nick reacts to killing someone for the first time. As they walk away, some dude in camo starts shooting and missing terribly at Nick and the gang. Nick recognizes him, it's Diego, but of course. How the fuck did Diego not know who this was before he started shooting? He's 10 feet away! I hate this idiot. So anyway, Diego apparently went AWOL on his military unit to seek out Nick. This is very important. Diego has a plane that needs fixing, which is why he needs Nick's help. Nick can fix anything, obviously. The plane details are discussed, Diego drops the key, 
Nick gets bitten by a zombie because naturally cutscenes are more important than gameplay. Then Rhonda tells Nick to go on his own to find Zombrex. Let me get this straight. Nick, the super duper fixer upper, the guy who Diego was looking for since only he could fix that plane, the guy who all of them appear to be relying on is abandoned to find Zombrex on his own. Ridiculous. Absurd. You need to go to the morgue since that's the place Rhonda thinks will have emergency Zombrex. Once you get there, you find Gary. Gary is the best character in the game and it's not even close. His voice acting was really well done and his dynamics with Nick are entertaining. He's so much better than everyone else, I decided to look him up. The voice actor's name is Daniel Roebuck, and from IMDb, it says he's only been in three video games in total, LA Noir, Dead Rising 3, and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. I am now more inclined to play those games more thoroughly, strictly to hear more of his work. It's truly great. So if you're out there, Daniel, thank you for giving me the strength to stick through with this story. Gary says he's here to find a body for his boss, who is implied to be a big shot crook or something, Nick goes in to unlock the main door, which of course he kicks open. They then come across the service for Otis, the janitor from the original game. Otis was in Colorado during the first game, and just so happens to be having his funeral service not only at the exact time of a huge outbreak, but in California. Pandering callbacks are annoying in their own right, but this was so worthless of an inclusion it kind of hurts. I guess I was supposed to excitedly say, hey, I know him, and be happy that I'm one of the cool kids who understood that reference. When Gary and you can't find the dead body in the drawers, you check the back room. Nick reacts to seeing the dead body, thinking it was Annie? How dumb can Nick be? This body was definitely here before the outbreak, and he just saw Annie like half an hour ago. Regardless, they find that the emergency Zombrex is completely gone, so Nick decides to wait out the inevitable. I really like Gary, he elevates this scene into something not terrible. I'll let it play out just so you can see I don't hate everything. So you don't gotta suffer. Just hurry. Alright, okay, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Coming right up. Oh my god. I think the safety's on. Can I, can I see the gun? Let me see the gun. Yeah. By the way, you're welcome. Will you just do it? Okay, I'll do it. I'm not the best shot. Give me a moment. Oh, oh shit. That was my last bullet. Nick's wound is apparently healing itself, so he doesn't need Zombrex. Again, Gary is fantastic at the end of this scene. Huh. Well, it worked out okay, you know. I mean, I didn't really want to shoot you. You seem like an okay guy. Um... Thanks. Okay. Let's go. Don't help me, whatever. You drive not Annie back to the club where Gary's boss is. We don't get to see who his boss is, but apparently that wasn't the girl he was looking for. Nick doesn't know why Gary is staying here working for him. Gary says he doesn't have anything to live for anyway, then asks Nick about Annie. Gary thinks Annie could be who his boss is looking for, says he'll give Nick fuel for the plane if he brings her back to his boss. Nick hesitates, but says he can go see where she went. Very strange why Nick wouldn't just ask them why they want Annie. The lack of details makes it sound like they want her for something sinister or weird or something. After getting back to Rhonda and the others, Diego is going crazy and... Well, the importance of Nick's neck tattoo is completely tossed aside thanks to the ability to hide it with ridiculous outfits. Never in the previous games was the appearance of someone important to the story, but Nick's number 12 tattoo on his neck is vital to the plot. They kind of shot themselves in the foot with this one, especially given the fact that for some reason this game doesn't allow you to just take off a mask or a hat. You need to find a different replacement mask, otherwise go back to the safe room to change clothes. I was trying to get rid of this dang hazmat mask for a long time, and unfortunately kept replacing it with different shit. Anyway, Diego used to live with Nick in foster homes as a kid and said they've always had those tattoos on their neck. Nick explains how they can get fuel by trading Annie for it, and Rhonda gets giddy with excitement at the thought of giving Annie over to them. This is where she takes the time to explain what graffiti symbols to watch out for, which don't matter as the quest marker lands directly where you need to go anyway. 
When you get there, some random girl blocks the way forward and won't let you pass unless you do her some fetch quests. She doesn't ask Nick how she knows Annie, doesn't care to know if Annie wants to see him, and Nick doesn't try to talk his way out of this stupid ordeal. He instead happily goes searching for a tattoo kit and a wedding ring. If this was any other game, this would be a bottom of the barrel side quest at best. It doesn't bring you closer to this character as she doesn't matter at all, and it in no way furthers any plot developments. For all intents and purposes, this is a side quest. Someone you don't know tells you to fetch items and you do it. She opens up the door, doesn't even tell Annie or anyone that you're coming in and just lets you walk around their base. She then proceeds to leave the door open. Throughout the rest of the game, this door stays wide open. I even drew some zombies into the base and she didn't give a shit. This game is so painstakingly awful. I still thank the heavens I never have to play this tripe again. After you walk in the first time, because the lady you just helped doesn't bother to tell anyone you're here, these random dumbasses start shooting at you. This idiot even says, Whatever it is, it's still alive. Like it's not plainly obvious it's a fucking human? He then says this. Are you a friend or a foe? Hey, wait, wait, wait. Are you a friend or a foe? Because, you know, this is how people talk. Honestly, George Lucas writes better dialogue than this. Annie appears, says she knows him. He asks her to go to Ingleton with him. She knows exactly what he's up to and calls him out on it, which upsets Red, the idiot. So she knows some guy is looking for her, but Nick never bothers to ask her why. It's just accepted for whatever reason. I can't get over how terribly written Red's lines are. Nick tells them about the plane, and completely unprompted and unrelated to anything else, Red says that he's a realist. Just listen. He's been leading up the resistance for- I'm a realist, Nick. Speaking of which... None of this flows well together at all. It's like some fever dream. Red explains that the government is killing off survivors instead of saving them, and now to prove himself, Nick must go out and destroy cameras and supply caches to disrupt the government or something. So you go around shooting at cameras, disrupting satellite things, and blowing up supply caches. They mention you should have explosives or fire to destroy them, but I have no idea why, as you can just punch them and they blow up. Fucking stupid. This is where the greed boss fight happens, again, completely out of nowhere and unrelated to the plot. The last supply cache is apparently in this house, and the boss fight starts. After you get all of them and return to Annie, she turns around like she was expecting a zombie or something. What's the point of having a person watch the door if you're expecting zombies to roll in at any moment? Nick wants to ask if Annie and Red are a thing. Red interrupts. He has news of computer recordings at a police station that show the government killing survivors, I guess. So Nick goes to check on the police station while Annie and Red go check on the other illegal crew member, Angel. Nick shows up at the police station, the police chief talks about the evidence, which is on a flash drive, and the guy puts it in her cleavage, I guess. Some survivor comes in with his wife, who is hurt, police chief gives the okay to shoot and kill her, for some reason, then he kills the guy. I don't get this random evilness, but alright. Nick gives away his cover so he can say, You murdered these people! The chief runs away, you kill armored goons and chase her, then you have a boss fight. I don't think this fight is actually too bad. Basically everything in the room will be destroyed, which is kind of neat. Her soundtrack is the only one I liked, and her plopping in and out of the windows wasn't as annoying as I expected it to be. The only part I didn't like is the needless extra enemies that spawn in after a while. I hardly ever like bosses that include lesser enemies to fight, so the circumstances or mechanics need to work overtime for it to work. And they don't, so they just become an extra hassle. When you slash her enough times, she shoots an RPG at you, you tackle her and fly out the building. Nick lands on her cleavage unscathed, because that's how boobs work, and takes the flash drive. You then meet Annie in red to find Angel shot dead in the head. Don't worry, she wasn't someone we've been introduced to, so her death means basically nothing to us. Red wonders why they even keep fighting. Annie points to Angel and says she was part of the family. They don't stop fighting if it's for family. I guess that's what they call their dumb faction of illegals, the family. This whole thing seems overacted and melodramatic. Red having second thoughts about fighting back just seems really out of place. 
But then again, he's a realist, you know. I'm a realist, Nick. Red tells you to meet him at the comm tower after he gets fuel for the airplane so they can all get out together. I'll break it up here since it's much easier to discuss future events with the benefit of full spoilers. Again, I've already said I don't recommend this game to anyone under any circumstances anyway, but if you're stubborn and want to experience a genuinely terrible game without ruining some of the major plot points, you can go ahead and call it a day. Thanks for watching. For everyone else, oh, Jesus Christ, just, <laughs> it gets so much worse. Continuing on, after a long while being forced to explore the city while you wait for the story to continue, you head back to the comm tower. Take a look at this completely avoidable inconsistency. You need to talk to Annie, as in press the B button for the cutscene to trigger. So here I am shooting at her, like I do. But when the cutscene starts, Nick walks in and she gets startled. <laughs> Ridiculous. I hate this game. You could have easily just triggered the cutscene to occur when you walked in. Next thing you know, Gary shows up with a gun! He's about to take Annie away, and wouldn't you know it, at this exact moment, a government raid happens. What are the odds? Very likely if you're a writer for Capcom Vancouver. They choose to capture everyone but Nick. Nick stays there unconscious. For no reason other than the guy saying, keep moving, leave the rest. Since we're in major spoiler territory, I'm going to spoil something that comes up later on. One more warning. After a while, it's revealed that Nick is the person the government is searching for, and even later on, it's revealed that this entire outbreak was orchestrated intentionally for the sole purpose of finding him, since he's immune to the zombies. Now yes, they don't know it's him specifically yet, but they know it's someone with the numbered tattoo on their neck. The tattoo on Nick's neck isn't hard to read, and what's worse about this raid, there wasn't anyone else left behind besides Nick meaning they weren't running from being shot at by backup or anything, they just rushed for no reason. What's worse, they have Red show up afterwards to wake up Nick. They could have easily had him upstairs in the bathroom even while the raid started, then have him come to the rescue, shooting at the soldiers in a scramble, which would cause them to rush and leave Nick behind. So often this rubbish would be fixed with a little more planning, and it's just sad. Red shows up afterwards to wake up Nick. He knows exactly where they went, since, of course, he's seen them create a makeshift prison the past few days. Why they decided to capture these people instead of killing them is for a dumb reason. When Nick asks about the fuel, Red scoffs at him about saving family first. He then tells Nick to meet him at a very specific rooftop on the other side of the map. When you get there, I noticed this while editing. They had a softball for a funny moment, but neglected to even try. Red and Nick are hiding on the rooftop across from the prison camp, and there's a billboard in front of them with a guy pointing up. This basically writes itself, they could have made noise, the guards look over and see the billboard and think nothing of it, even though the guy on the billboard is pointing directly at them. Anyway, you have three ways to get in, as Red explicitly lays out for you. Barge right in, sneak in from the back, or steal one of their uniforms and walk right in. Very weird how they frame this. This is something you'd expect from the tutorial of a game with gameplay choices and decisions, not something as railroaded as Dead Rising 3, and not in a main quest in the middle of the game. Anyway, I snuck in the second time. but I think how I barged in the first time I played was much funnier. I also call bullshit on these shitty fences. I purposely blew up my car to try to get over them and it wouldn't allow it. Lame. So after you sneak into the headquarters, Nick overhears a lot of juicy plot things. So the leader of Phenotrans, Marion, wants the full six days before firebombing the city as she's trying to find the immune person who ends up being Nick. They bring in the president of the US, I guess. They infect her with a zombie worm thing that turns her into a zombie immediately. The military guy then wants them to record her eating a low-ranking officer so they can send it to the press. He says, mission accomplished, so I guess that was their goal? To kill off the president? I don't know. Marion says she wants Diego, probably because he had a neck tattoo, and she says deactivating the chips won't be so easy next time. I don't know what she's talking about at all, and it almost seems like they aren't even talking to each other. 
The military guy wants to study the new type of zombies that have mutated thanks to the radiation caused by turning the chips off. He wants their royal jelly to make a weapon. All I can think of is Futurama here, which makes everything he said seem silly. Marion gets mad at him for losing focus, which is absurd. She clearly isn't listening to him. He said he's only indulging her fantasies because it's fun, and he said mission accomplished when the president was infected. It's like these two had their lines written without thought of who they'd be talking to. So Marion tells them to go look for Diego in the quarantine tent. If they can't find him, to kill them all. Then Nick gets caught directly afterwards. Marion just vanishes, I guess. It's not like they made a quiet escape or anything, but she's nowhere to be found during the next sequence. So you free the captives, Annie is happy to see you, Nick saves Gary because he understands Gary is the saving grace behind the story. Then we have a Wilhelm scream. Just embarrassing. You kill off some goons, and then we have the most ridiculous attempt at giving us a boss for this area. This commander guy comes out, has a boss's health bar, the fandom page says he's a boss, but is literally exactly the same as the goons you just killed. Mash the Y button to victory. He never got an intro cutscene or death cutscene. What a loser. Annie escapes in a van with the others. Nick stops Gary from catching them, but Gary is awesome and realizes he was just saved by Nick, so he doesn't punch him in the face. He then says he's going to go find Annie. Red stabs a dude, then asks Nick about the one of the poster about his tattoo. Five million dollars for his capture. So Red says he's also going to look for Andy and the others, like they're lost or something, and Nick should get the fuel and meet him at the karaoke bar later on. When you arrive at the garage with the fuel in it, you see your first mutated zombie. It's pretty hilarious looking. I do think it's a step in the right direction though. Part of why I don't like endless amounts of zombies is because it's hard to separate them from their recent divorce from humanity. They're so human-like that I think it's absurd for the game to expect me to ignore all empathy for these victims and slash and kill them for fun. This guy is clearly mutated beyond just being an average looking human, he's some nest for the parasitic wasps. So yeah, a step in the right direction in my opinion. You drive the fuel car to Rhonda and the gang. Boy, it feels like a long time since we've seen them, huh? Diego has run off with the plane key. Rhonda gets sad about the mistake she's made and talks about how she messed things up with her ex, which kind of comes out of nowhere to be honest. To undercut the mood, trucker hat asshole grabs Rhonda's butt. How very unnecessary. This character is useless and if you cut him out of the game entirely, literally nothing would fucking change. Absolutely nothing. On the radio you hear an announcement that the general will stick to his six day timeline for bombing the city and there were reports of the president being zombified. They sure do reference that six day time frame a lot, huh? Afterwards, Rhonda says she's missing parts for the plane, which will be a problem later that Rhonda will look into, but right now Nick should go find Diego at the museum. Nick tells Rhonda that the government is doing bad things and the president was killed by Hemlock on purpose. Hemlock, of course, being the military guy. Rhonda doesn't believe him, even though Nick could say he literally saw it happen, but he doesn't because Nick is stupid. Rhonda asks if Nick gave Annie in for the fuel. He says he didn't, and she likes that answer. She's happy he didn't turn her in, yet she was the one who told him to do it, which was why she gave him directions to their safe house in the first place. Oh look, by the power vested in me as the editor for my videos, we can watch the clip of her saying this. Maybe. I met this guy. He's looking for Annie, I think. He said he'd give me some fuel if I can lead her to him. Ha! What's not to love about that? It's a win-win. Besides, a little so-and-so deserves what she's got coming. Yeah, but... Did you turn her into that man to get the fuel? Let's just say... I came up with a different plan. <laughs> You're one of the good ones, Nick. Why the sudden change, Rhonda? So you track down Diego at the museum. This next part was so ridiculous, if I wasn't set on doing a video on this game, and if the crashing didn't drive me away already, I would have turned the game off at this point and never looked back. You chase Diego into the space exhibit, and he comes out hovering in a space suit. If the game had a less serious tone, I think this could have been pulled off as a campy moment, but everything surrounding it, even the music, is so intense and grandiose. Mechanically, this fight is pretty boring. You shoot him when he's flying to bring him down, then you do a grab attack on him, repeat. 
Him flying around in the spacesuit is just so stupid. I should mention, the reason you're fighting him in the first place is... He's got PTSD, I guess, and went crazy. We've come a long way from Cliff in the first game, haven't we? After you defeat him, he comes to his senses, muttering Pachamama. This should be a nice clue to what's going on, and is why I just can't accept the idea that this game is trying to be campy or pretending to be bad for shits and giggles. This museum of past outbreak stuff is very interesting, specifically the reveal where the first outbreak after Willamette was caused by a guy with a tattoo on his neck. They freak out as sure enough that's the same kind of tattoo they have. Like, this is by far the best reveal in the entire game, and to their credit, Nick and Diego both give great performances. This part is good, and makes me wish the creators gave this single scene to some other company to let them construct a good story around it. Now look at his neck. No, 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 holy crap, man! No, what does that mean, man? I don't know, right? What the hell? Anyway, you then spot a weird slimy worm crawling through Diego's neck. Pretty creepy. I stuck around here reading about the history of Frank, Isabella, Carlito, and so on. Definitely my favorite area in the game. Isabella's bio says she was arrested after the Willamette incident, placed in a high security detention facility, but is currently off the radar. Frank won awards and became famous for covering the Willamette story, but his claims that the government was behind it all and etc. were discredited as just him having PTSD. Now he's a zombie consultant, uh, which I can't even begin to understand what that means. If you listen to one of the audio tours, it says a disproportionate amount of the outbreaks came from foster homes. This got me excited immediately, as the foster kid time bomb thing from the first game hasn't been touched on yet. Since Nick and Diego already said they grew up in foster homes, it was here when I realized just how far removed from the events from the previous game we are. This urged me to check back on the cutscenes from the first game again, and I'm pretty unimpressed. You see all of the foster kids' names show up on the screen, and there wasn't a hint of a Nick or Diego anywhere. It just seems like it would have been such an easy slam dunk for continuity. Go back and watch the scene, grab two names, and the hardcore fans will praise you for it. It did show that there were a few foster kids sent to California, so they had it correct with that anyway. So Diego said the biker dudes took the airplane key from him, so they have to go get it back. This next quest is one of the strangest parts in the entire game. You go after the people who took the key, but you find all of the zombies in the area are dead. This is the only time you'll ever come across a site like this in the game. It's a very eerie mood, and they even comment on how weird it is. <laughs> So you'd think this is obviously foreshadowing some huge threat, some sinister thing. At least a boss fight, right? Nope. Literally just random biker dudes hanging out in a tennis court. Just kill them like normal and grab the key. What was the point of this, exactly? Why take the key from Diego at all if it's just going to lead to a boring letdown of an encounter? It makes me wonder if the development team ran out of time and had to start cutting chunks out. This is the only time in the game that there's an entire area completely clear of zombies, visually demonstrating some sort of incoming threat even bigger than the zombies themselves, and the best they could come up with is regular enemies that appear all over the map under normal circumstances just chilling in a tennis court. It's just sad. Of course, after you grab the key, you're on the other side of the map yet again, wasting even more of your time. When you get back to Rhonda, you see that they've painted the plane pink. What a good use of your time, hmm. Rhonda is worried about Diego, but Nick says he's fine. He saw the parasite wiggling around in him, so I don't know what he's talking about. Now Rhonda decides to figure out how to find the parts for the plane. Why she wasn't doing that instead of painting it fucking pink is beyond me. So now you get to waste time exploring the city. On my first playthrough, this was fine since I wanted to explore a bit, but on my second playthrough, this was torture. Just fucking get on with it already. After enough time has passed, you come back to Rhonda saying she discovered a letter about some plane collector who happens to have the parts they need. Nick again assures Rhonda that Diego is fine, as he's being a total weirdo. Then she asks for Diego's help to put the fuel in the plane. I ask you, what were they doing this whole time? Paint the plane pink and finding a fucking letter. 
God, G Jesus Christ, I hope they all die for their lackadaisical and unmotivated work ethic and for making Nick do literally every fetch quest under the sun while Trucker Hat Idiot provides fucking nothing. Okay. So you go to the collector's mansion, and once you walk in, a lockdown activates, which barricades all the exits. I'm fairly certain I've been in this house before, but who knows or even cares at this point. You disable the alarm, lockdown deactivates, then you follow the quest markers to the exact location of the plane parts, which aren't even located in the mansion, but in the yard. One of the three parts isn't here, instead you find a receipt, because the game just won't let it end. So you travel to a different part of the map just to chase down another exact pinpoint location to grab the last part. What a worthwhile way to spend a half hour in the game. You make it back to the plane, Rhonda puts the parts in the plane within a few seconds, I guess. She calls Nick Kitten Lips, uh, which is just a really weird thing to say, and decides to leave. Even though she's been trying to get out more than anyone else, she decides she needs to find her ex instead. She has no game plan other than to go back to her garage. And of course, she never once mentions her ex's name, which would make everything so much simpler. Next thing you know, all three of the guys go searching for Annie and the others, even though this trucker hat idiot never once left the safe area the whole game. When they walk out, they get ambushed, Diego screams like a girl, and Diego and Nick get captured and brought back to a facility. Oh my god. Hang on. Before we move on, let's watch this again because fuck this whole cutscene. Rhonda just left. She literally left moments before they did. Where is she? How does Diego, the guy who has never been funny the entire game, the guy with PTSD so bad he became an astronaut, get this screaming like a girl bit? Where does this trucker hat guy go? He doesn't get captured. Maybe they left him there because they rushed like last time. They've already shown no reservations on killing survivors, so just do us all a favor and take him out. There wasn't even any reason for him to leave the plane in the first place. It's all so dumb. <sighs> so Nick and Diego wake up in constraints. Marion calls them orphans. Diego is losing his mind. Marion wants them to activate Diego first. Rapid typing ensues by random doctors, a gigantic laser beam is shot into Diego, screaming, then all these bugs and shit pop out of his body. Insert chaos here, because for some reason they didn't take this scenario into account for some fucked reason. Nick then just escapes, inexplicably, because he's the protagonist, why else? This is just embarrassing, they needed him to escape for the plot. Marion leaves her viewing area, so she of course can't immediately see him doing it, and then he yanks himself out. What would have made far more sense is Isabella, who we'll see in literal moments anyway, freeing him, or at the very least have the constraints open on their own so we can think Isabella did it behind the scenes. Instead, Nick is just super strong, I guess. So you walk for a few seconds before running into Isabella. Nick fucking flips out and starts choking her based off of the rumors of her starting the outbreak in Willamette. Well, I guess I'm not exactly sure if this is unrealistic. If I was put in Nick's place and I somehow ran into the leader of a terrorist group, would I tackle them? I don't know, but it sure seemed odd. She calls him number 12, saying she's been looking for him. I really hope what the game is trying to convey is she has been looking for the immune orphan and she now sees that it's number 12. If she knew it was 12 even as far back as 10 minutes ago, they would have had no reason to test their laser on Diego. So she says she's going to tell him about everything, Marion closes the gate, Nick tells Isabella to go to the plane and they'll meet up later. What follows is... a boss fight, I think. You attack these machine arm loaders and it's not very exciting. The electric rake, by the way, has incredible durability. It somehow doesn't break after repeated uses, and it's pretty strong. So after you take out however many loaders it was, I don't know, I didn't bother to count before reading this, the last loader smacks you into some big thing that makes Marion fall over, I guess. I keep saying it, but really, it's embarrassing looking. She has a beam placed on her chest ever so delicately while Hemlock walks in. <laughs> it just looks so silly. This next bit, again, solely exists to pad out the game's length. To get to the next destination, you need to walk through this metro tunnel area. 
You get locked in. Some guys on the overspeaker mock Nick, saying they remember him from the highway. I'm assuming this is referring to the bikers from the first act. I have no clue why the game wastes so much time with this part. You've encountered bikers throughout the entire game, so it's not like this is them reintroducing themselves as a faction for the first time. And what's worse, you just got the key from the bikers earlier. Why was this included? It doesn't serve the plot at all, it doesn't raise the stakes, it doesn't even make any sense once you find the bikers afterwards. How do they lock this metro down? They don't even take advantage of this contrivance to offer up some quality gameplay, as this entire sequence of following the destination markers is insultingly simplistic and boring as fuck. Unlock the doors. Once you get there, turn on the power. Once you get there, find some wire. Once you get there, turn on the power. Once you get there, unlock the doors. It's like a merry-go-round of pointless, torturous, irrelevant tasks that only serve to pad out the game's already inflated length. I can't help but show you the perfect example of how completely trivial this all is. This door is locked. The only reason it's locked is to elongate this monotonous task by another minute or two. You walk around, this was the door that was locked. You kick it open, now it's unlocked. It's like I'm a rat in a maze, but I don't even get cheese at the end, I get to follow an omniscient objective marker to the exact location of the only spool of wire in the entire area. Once you escape the metro, again, you'd think some kind of big confrontation would happen, but it's just the biker idiots who you can just run right past with no problems. Even when you do fight them, it takes a matter of seconds to clear them out. Utterly ridiculous. Time and time again, Capcom Vancouver dragged out this trash fire of a game, seemingly at my expense alone. I'm sure it was apparent with how I sound, but I'm pretty annoyed. Legitimately, when I was watching the footage back to write this, it all came flooding back and I had to take a break. I call into question every reviewer at the time who praised this near unanimously because they were so infatuated with more zombies on screen and a big empty boring monochromatic map that they completely ignored how terrible and inane most of this game is. Even without the PC issues, the game shows repeatedly how poorly written and executed its ideas were, and it truly boggles my mind that I'm in the minority on this. I thought I would feel apathy, and to an extent I did during a few bits, but the main emotion I felt was resentment. I resent this game not only because it's a bad Dead Rising game, but because it's terrible and I wasted 20 hours of my life, and I do mean that. It stole that time from me and I will never get it back. That's how I'm going to remember this game. <sighs> okay. Gary is in the next scene, so thankfully I can calm down. You arrive at the karaoke bar to find Annie, but Gary is blocking the door. I can't believe how well done his lines are even when you walk towards him. He doesn't just stand there silent while you approach, he starts talking to you while you walk to the door. I regret not waiting for his dialogue to finish on both of my playthroughs, but to be honest, at this point I just wanted it to be over so badly. Even though I love Gary, and his acting is very good in this scene like usual, everything leading to this is so poorly paced and thought out. The last time we saw Annie was her escaping in a van with the other illegals after rescuing them from the government prison. That was a long time ago. That's also the last time we saw Gary or Red, as both said they were going to keep looking for Annie. This game has a habit of making you spend time with some characters for an incredibly long amount of time, then going without them for that same length of time. This cutscene is also a fine showing for the absolute idiocy that is Nick and his lack of speech. Now, I have a speech impediment, I know what it feels like to be unable to get words out, but that's not what Nick's issue is, he just doesn't fucking say what you want him to say. Gary's voice actor goes all out, saying how much he hates his job, hates his life, and everything. He used to be a wrestler, had a beautiful wife and a big house, that wife being Rhonda. Yes, the Rhonda you've been spending most of the story with, Instead of talking to Gary, telling him that he knows Rhonda, she misses him too, they can both go get her and everyone is happy, Nick just laughs at him, then asks if he still wants to see her, almost like a threat? He never asked Gary who his boss was, he never asked Gary why his boss wanted Annie, he never asked Annie why Gary was looking for her, he never asked Rhonda who her ex was, he never asked Gary who his ex was, and he never happened to name drop either Gary or Rhonda when talking with the other person. All of this was just to protect the very fragile twists of the game. If any of these questions were asked, the game couldn't pretend to be profound with these attempts at tying things together. 
Putting shocking reveals ahead of the real story and characters is putting the cart before the horse. Subverting audiences' expectations with a twist never makes something that was bad into something that is good. It only serves to elevate an already solid piece of media. And then it has to stand the scrutiny of a second viewing. Even if a twist sounds good initially, it has to be properly foreshadowed without giving things away, and has to avoid the traps that so many writers like the ones for Dead Rising 3 run into. Playing this for the second time, all I could think of is why doesn't Nick ask any of these questions? How does he conveniently never name drop Gary or Rhonda, but talk freely of other people? Why doesn't Nick tell Gary he knows who Rhonda is? The other twist is just as bad, and that's coming up soon. So anyway, Nick dodges some punches from Gary, because of course Nick Ramos, the professional boxer, is undefeated. The Almighty fandom page doesn't even have any erroneous detail of him inexplicably becoming a boxing champion, so maybe I should just add it in, because it's clear. So it was at this point in my first playthrough that I screwed myself over severely, and without knowing it, forced my future self to play this whole thing again. You have the option to go get Rhonda or kill Gary. I killed Gary for the sole purpose of seeing if I could. The game, since it hasn't allowed me to kill anyone important in the entirety of it, has conditioned me to start shooting at important characters habitually. I was so shocked to see that I could actually kill Gary, and ashamed at how ridiculously simple he was to kill, that I just kept going. This is why these sorts of things come off as contrived and basically cheating in a way. Killing or saving Gary isn't a profound moral decision since I could never have killed him before. The reason why you can only do it now is because they finally revealed the twist about Rhonda. They didn't want players to miss out on the reveal on their first playthrough, so they made sure every single story beat went exactly the way they wanted, and only when they felt the player has enough information, they removed his invulnerability. If I could have killed him earlier on and ruined the story for myself, I probably would have never made the decision to start shooting him here. I like Gary, but my brain went into autopilot and got excited for a split second when I realized the game was finally letting me do what I had wanted to do the whole time. What's worse about this, even if we pretend that issue doesn't exist and he wasn't invincible earlier, this decision still loses all coherence. What is gained by killing Gary? There's no rationale given by Gary, Nick, or the game itself to why this would be something that should ever be considered. The option to save Rhonda isn't hidden or anything. The moment the cutscene ends, the quest tells you to go get her, with the marker placed directly where she is on the map. There's no way for her to die in the story previously, so she will always be available to be rescued for this section. There's only two reasons I can possibly see for killing Gary. One, the shock at the idea that you are allowed to kill an important character. And two, you want to see the bad ending on purpose. No sensible person who was faithfully engaging with the game would even think about killing him. It's downright insulting that they even presented it like a genuine moral dilemma. All things considered, this is an absolute train wreck. If you do decide to kill him, Capcom Vancouver shows again that they refuse to actually improve on their past mistakes. In the past, you've gotten calls before from Otis or Stacy during boss fights, which was very annoying, but nothing in those previous games, aside from maybe finding a zombified Brad, had any levels of melancholy to them. If you decide to kill Gary, his lines are genuinely sad. But... Yo, Fady in a fancy outfit fighting off the Psalms at the outdoor stage in... It would be so easy to disallow calls to come through during these intense moments. Whatever scraps of goodwill they managed to salvage after that ham-fisted choice was completely thrown out the window. If you're in a story or boss fight, Jamie just shouldn't be allowed to call you, period. So on my second playthrough, I went to get Rhonda instead, as that's the only way to get the true ending. So you go back to her garage, and this next bit is pretty hilarious. You find Rhonda slumped down with her arm chopped off. She says they tortured her. I don't know who they are, or why they let her get to her garage, but here she is with only one arm. I think this is extremely funny to think about. She had no plan to find Gary. The only thing she was going to do was regroup at her garage, and this is how she ends up? Yeah. So when you go out to get her the first aid kit, the government is outside and ambushes you? Is this who she was talking about? 
Why would they torture her? Why aren't they going into the garage? Nick finally says Gary's name, Rhonda gets excited, but won't go with Nick until she looks presentable, and sends you off on a fetch quest. I was beyond pissed off at this point, thinking again the game was going to waste my time, but finding the items took like 10 seconds. Why couldn't they have just included this in the cutscene? When you return to her, the prompt literally says, Combo Rhonda. I couldn't believe my eyes, truly. What is this? Am I dreaming? Then he constructs some Bioshock-esque arm attachment that shoots out flames. Yeah, I must be dreaming. You bring her back to Gary, and since Gary is happy, I guess I'm happy. He again has a great moment when he forgets to unlock the door. Uh, Gary? Oh, yeah. I forgot, sorry. Uh, here. Um, I put her up high, I put a bunch of zombies around her. Just be careful in there. What? <laughs> so yeah, you go in and save Annie. She says Red was supposed to meet her there, but he never showed up. Annie and Nick have a romantically charged moment, and then you travel across the map again to get to the plane. You arrive finally, and Isabella and Red run in like they're out of breath? What were they doing? How long were those two running side by side? How did this trucker hat idiot get back here? Where the fuck was he after Diego and Nick got captured? I hate this game. Annie wants Red to find the others, but I don't know where they all went either. What happened to them? They never show up again. Red says he'll go look in one more area that they can't sacrifice everyone else. Jesus Christ, it's so terribly delivered as well. Have a listen. Yeah, I know. We cannot sacrifice everyone else, okay? All right? So be ready when I get back. Annie then fucking recognizes Isabella out of nowhere and gets pissy at her for causing the outbreak in Willamette. You know, the one when Annie was an infant since this game takes place a decade after the previous game. Isabella then goes on to not explain what happened in Willamette, you know, to clear her name, but explain what happened in her homeland about the foster kids thing instead. The explanation is Carlito decided when he implanted the parasite into the foster kids to act as time bombs, to keep one of them immune so they could one day make a cure. Yeah, fucking right. It's all so fucking contrived. I don't believe for a second that Carlito would do that. I went back to watch the cutscenes in the original where his orphan time bomb stuff was being discussed, and only briefly did Isabella mention he was working on a way to suppress the virus. However, it was heavily implied he was only suppressing it so they wouldn't turn into zombies immediately, but later on like a time bomb. No cure was mentioned. Red, then, from outside the warehouse, calls out for Nick and Annie. He needs help with something. Admiral Akbar then says, And Nick proceeds to beat up an armed guard, once again, without any problems. What follows is quite possibly my favorite line of the game. Nick! <laughs> once more. Nick! Okay, maybe one more time. Nick! Nick! <laughs> If it wasn't clear, this isn't a joke told by Red, I'm laughing at the delivery again. So Red wants to turn Nick in for the $5 million, which if you remember he saw on the flyer from earlier. He once again says he's a realist, out of nowhere. I don't think Capcom writers understand how people talk. Wait, I think I've said this in the video already. So then you have a boss fight against a big claw grabber machine, shooting at the weak points while other enemies get added to the mix. If this claw grabber didn't kill my excitement for the climax enough, the game decided to crash on me quite a few times during this fight. So that was fun. Afterwards, you save Annie and Isabella, but in comes Red for a final confrontation. See that knife he has? Yeah, he barely even uses it. Instead, he charges at you, punches you, and so on. There was one time I saw him use it, but it was for an animation which appears to be a punch, but it has a slicing audio in it instead. So you stun him, grab him, punch him, shoot him with grenade launchers, and so on. This may sound ridiculous and off-topic, but this video is already so long. So while this fight is playing, I want to discuss the fandom page for Dead Rising once more. Look at these two bits of trivia for Red. How anyone can believe Sullivan betrayed Chuck for money, and that he was a leader of a group of survivors is just bewildering to me. Did they play the game? The other one says that Red's role as a traitor was hinted at along the way, Referring to things that happened in the story before Red saw the Wanted Flyer. I don't buy this at all, as even Red himself said that once he saw the $5 million flyer is when he decided to turn him in. 
This is pretty damning, not only to this fandom page since it's clearly rubbish, but for the story itself. The people on here thought Red was a traitor the whole time, which he wasn't, meaning not only did I not like any of his lines or delivery, his dialogue and facial reactions made some of the most dedicated fans come to a false conclusion. Anyway, you defeat him, his death cutscene shows him getting crushed by Annie. So you then find a transceiver with Hemlock on the other side, asking if his soldier has found the orphan. Nick pretends to be him and requests for more time. He then kisses Annie. This is basically where the game ends if you killed Gary. Lame. If you kept him alive, this happens. So Chuck Green shows up. Annie is actually Katie Green, because of fucking course she is, right? It's like Star Wars, where everyone is the son or daughter of someone important. This is the twist they were hiding the entire game. This is why they didn't tell you about the date in the opening cutscene. This is why they never showed Gary's boss. This is why Gary never disclosed any details about him at all. This is why you couldn't ask Annie why Gary was looking for her. This is why you couldn't ask Gary why they were looking for Annie. All of it for this reveal. Was it worth it? No. No. Why are you asking? Absolutely not. This is just a what a twist moment. Nothing is gained by having Annie be Katie. The only thing it does allow is Chuck to show up. I like Chuck a lot more than Nick, so I am happy to see him. But they had to dumb so much of the dialogue and character interactions down to get to this point. Annie also acts surprised to see him, so it's clear she didn't know why Gary was after her in the first place. How absolutely inane. It's hard to comprehend how stupid these characters are. Chuck thought, to find Katie, it's best for Gary, someone she doesn't know, to chase and capture her without disclosing any information. How can anyone at Capcom's writing staff think this makes sense? How? So Nick acts like a tough guy because his penis is apparently completely erect. That's my interpretation anyway. Maybe I should add that bit of trivia to the fandom page. <laughs> Then Isabella runs over, Chuck is surprised to see her. I guess they know each other from one of the Dead Rising 2 DLC stories that are locked away forever on the Xbox 360 that I unfortunately cannot play. So the plane won't fit everyone, so Rhonda and Gary decide to stay back. Saying they're going to truck any survivors they find out of the city, Gary says that they'll find a way. It's clear no one knows what's going on anymore, and Capcom are just writing down any lines they can, trying to meet their deadline. This city is locked down. The whole point of the story was that you're stuck in the city with no escape. Don't you remember the first fucking minutes of the game, where Nick tries to find a way out, but he can't because there isn't one? Don't you remember the parts where Hemlock said he's going to firebomb the city in a few days? Nah, Rhonda says Nick will always have a family here, even though he won't because they'll be dead if they stay. What the fuck ever. It gets worse though. They get in the plane, and of course, no one knows how to fly a plane. I'd also like to show you how the game ends if you killed Gary, didn't save Rhonda, and thus never got to see Chuck. Watch, the exact same conversation happens where he doesn't know how to fly a plane. The plane doesn't start, and the story just ends. Whereas in the good ending, the plane moves, even though the pilot is the same person. This issue bleeds into the start of overtime mode as well. The ramifications of the true ending don't relate to anything, both player decisions and cutscene consequences. Because you saved Rhonda and Gary, thus got to see Chuck in the airplane this time around, not only does the plane move, but you overhear that Hemlock is undergoing some diabolical scheme in the city. This leads to Nick and Chuck attempting to thwart that scheme. If you can't see how this isn't a logical progression, let me explain how Overtime worked in the original Den Rising game. If you don't complete the story, the helicopter comes to rescue you and Frank escapes. If you completed the story, a zombie bites the pilot, thus leading to Frank's only method of escape being destroyed, causing Frank to once again be trapped in the mall. Yes, the zombie biting Ed is a bit ridiculous, as I've already explained in my video on it, but at least once that's done with, everything follows a natural cause and effect. Zombie bite, pilot is dead, plane crashes, Frank is stranded. Even in the sequel, it's clear as day. You choose to save TK with a dosage of Zombrex, thus him being alive means he's able to capture Katie and Stacy. This time around, replace completing the story from the original or giving Zombrex to TK in the sequel with saving Rhonda and Gary. 
You rescue Rhonda and Gary. Chuck talks to Nick and reunites with Katie. They're about to take off in the working plane when Hemlock announces his plans that were going to happen anyway. Rhonda and Gary being alive during this segment, or Chuck being present, of course wouldn't impact Hemlock's decision making. He was bound to attempt this zombie extraction plan seemingly no matter what. In addition to that though, regardless if it was a conscious decision by Nick from overhearing the plan this time, or being stranded in a non-working plane, Nick and friends were staying in the city either way. There's not even an attempt at explaining why the events of overtime required certain actions from the player. The motivator for Nick choosing to not escape was Hemlock's plan, which wasn't affected by any of his decisions. Before I move on from the bad ending entirely, there's one more thing that irks me about it. If you killed Gary and thus don't get a working plane for whatever reason, it's implied that Nick and the others died, most likely in the firebombing. It then goes on to say rumors of a cure planted in one of Carlito's surviving orphans were never substantiated but continue to this day. What the fuck are they smoking? The orphan Carlito thing was barely known about in the first place, but you're telling me out of Isabella, Annie, Trucker Hat Idiot, and Nick, the only ones alive who know about it at the end of the bad ending, even though all of them presumably die in this scenario anyway, the rumor spread somehow. Capcom, please think some of these things through. So they overhear, somehow in the airplane's radio, Hemlock talking about not firebombing the city until he finishes the job of collecting the new type of zombie for his weapon. I'd like to point out that I finished the story within the first two days this time around, and now the meter jumps to the seventh day. Also, this next part makes sense. Remember, Nick asked Hemlock for an extra day moments earlier. Capcom Vancouver wants it both ways. In the previous games, you only had three days, but story events would happen at specific time intervals to keep the timeline constant and the framing device of having a limit in the first place a plausible threat. This time around, they want to present the image of the time limit mechanic, but undermine it at every turn, allowing players to finish story quests as quickly as they like, which turns conversations about the firebombing threat into a joke. Nothing says our central time frame gimmick doesn't matter, like skipping ahead five days for players who go a little bit too fast. The only way Nick asking Hemlock for an extra day would make sense and fit with overtime mode is if you completed the red fight literally on the final day, that's the only time it would align with how the story is presenting this final chapter. If they're going to resort to skipping ahead five days, don't even give the players this false impression that there's a seven day time limit. The firebombing threat didn't need to be the same as the last games, where it was a warning against stagnation and complacency. It should have been tied to plot points in the story, actions and reactions from characters. So Nick and Chuck want to stop the general from doing evil things, all while Chuck's theme from Dead Rising 2 plays in the background. I will say, I did actually enjoy that part. On the ride to find Hemlock, Chuck talks about how he messed things up with Stacy, and Katie never forgave him for it. Kinda cool that the game brings it up, but I'm long past the point of caring, I just want this to be over. So once you find where the helicopter lands, you get a cutscene. Marion wants to find Nick for the cure still, but Hemlock only cares about the weaponized ways he can use the zombies, as of course he doesn't believe the immune orphan exists. Marion is straight up out of her mind when she dismisses him as being weak and pathetic. He's obviously in control here, she's in a wheelchair on top of a building. He of course throws her to her death. How she didn't see this sort of thing coming paints her as an absolute imbecile. I wouldn't say she deserves it, but come on now, how dumb can you be? So what follows in overtime mode almost feels like one last middle finger from Capcom Vancouver shoved right in my face. Following the helicopter to destroy the drones capturing zombies means you'll need to travel across the map on the shitty highway system, avoiding blockades every other turn, and popping up the map to figure out how to avoid them every 10 seconds. When I saw the quest thing say 60 drones, needed to be destroyed, I became so incredibly apathetic. I hold resentment after the fact, of course, but at the time, I felt so abused and run down, I just wanted it to stop. I became the drone, following destination markers, avoiding constant roadblocks, shooting down other drones without any thought other than what I was planning on eating once I finally finished this utter pit of despair known as Dead Rising 3. 
I believe there was even a part where I traveled across the map to where the helicopter was, then within a few seconds it left for a different spot very far away. I was broken. So once you shoot down the 60th drone, a cutscene plays. Nick does some acrobatic leap onto a drone into the helicopter. He of course gives away his advantage by announcing his arrival. He of course is a champion boxer who dodges Hemlock's punches and knocks out the pilot. And he of course survives a helicopter crash. So did Hemlock, sans shirt. It's a good look actually, I won't lie. So here we go, final ultimate boss fight. You're meant to get behind him, attack his back which stuns him, then perform grab attacks on him. The electric rake works here just fine as well though. I think Capcom has a fetish for fighting government officials with zombies all around. This is the third time in three games this has happened and that's only counting the final bosses. How many military characters do I need to kill in these games for this to be over? In his death cutscene where Hemlock is up against the rotating propeller of the helicopter, Nick says a dumb cheesy line and kicks him into the propeller which somehow makes it stop turning. Now I don't know how propellers work but I guess I'll trust Capcom Vancouver did extensive research on what happens when bodies fly into them. Nick talks to Annie over the transceiver. She says Isabella went back to the lab to find something. Then we see the plane fly overhead. I don't know who's flying it. No one knew how to fly a plane earlier. So the cure for the zombie parasitic infection was discovered. Hemlock was replaced. And we get an after credits cutscene. It's here we see Isabella's true motives. She was the one who caused the outbreak in the first place to draw out Nick. Marion is shown to disagree, thinking the outbreak will kill too many people, but Isabella is insistent that this plan will work. She is very egotistical and craves the title of the one who found the cure. She resents Frank and Chuck and wants to clear her family name and be a hero. Isabella basically destroys the evidence. Lights go out. A quote appears, since why not take one last moment to show how pretentious this game is, and we're done. Making such a hateful video was truly not my intention on the outset, but it became unavoidable. This is honestly such a long one that I doubt many viewers will get this far, and I don't really blame them. I look at the first half of this video as a fairly focused representation of how certain elements of the game didn't live up to my expectations, and were outright bad in their own right. And the second half of this video is me having some cathartic release at the story's expense. Some people might see it as rambly and nitpicky, and honestly, they'd probably be correct. The fact is, there was so much I disliked at every cutscene and main quest that I was finding it difficult to condense it in any meaningful way without sacrificing the story beats for anyone who hasn't played the game. I wanted to talk about Diego's boss fight so badly, all of them really, since that's what I've been doing in all of these videos, that I didn't think avoiding the entire story was possible. I've said this a few times already, but there were genuinely so many moments that would have caused me to put the game down and never come back to it if I weren't making a video on it. I'm in disbelief that I'm in the minority on this one. From critics to fans alike, most people seem to like Dead Rising 3. It's not only by far the worst Dead Rising game I've played so far, it's just a boring slog even ignoring the series it's attached to. This initially had me worried about Dead Rising 4, but now my current hypothesis is that I might actually like it more than most people. I haven't played any of it yet, but I can't fathom how it could be any worse than Dead Rising 3. As far as video games that I have finished, let alone finished fucking twice, I don't know if I can list any of them that I like less than this. I don't have a good line to end this with. I'll just leave you with one final word.